Hi, I'm Lauren Riley and I'd like to introduce you to my dad, Greg McDougall. He was an inventor, an entrepreneur and a visionary and I only met him for the first time when I was 20. I discovered he lived in Hong Kong but we were two peers in a pod and became inseparable. Very sadly, he passed away from cancer in 2008. However, I was able to capture his stories on film and I asked him every question I could imagine about his inventions and entrepreneurship, his relationships and travels around the world. So this first story is about how he designed the electric toothbrush and how he got Colgate to distribute it on a global basis and it became the number one selling product in its category for over 10 years. So introducing you to my dad, Greg McDougall. Go ahead, Greg. <laughs> so, around 89, 90, I've become world famous for my hair care product. One of my customers was Krups in Germany. Cook. Okay. This is a coffee maker, Krups. I would take all of my hair care products. And we were in New out in Hong Kong one day for a week to meet me on some new projects. And the head of the R&D asked me whether I could develop an electric toothbrush. Oh, okay. And I've never used one in my life, so I had no idea. So I said, okay, I'll try it. So a week or so, like, they went back to Germany, and a week or so later, they get this big, thick envelope with all of their market research, university reports of every toothbrush in the world. So I st studied all of those, found the good points and bad points, mm -hmm. and then I uh, started thinking. I came up with this event, what I thought was a fantastic idea. I was so excited about the phone. This R&D guy in Germany I said, I've got it, it's brilliant. And he says, how many, is it oscillating? And I said, yes, how many degrees? I said, 25 to 30. Yep. He says, forget it, no good. Oh, in terms of the way it oscillates? Yeah. He said, <coughs> he said forget it, it's no good. It must be 60 or more. Yeah. It has to be better than Braun. Braun's for 60. So back to the drawing board. A week later, I came up with one that was rotated 120 degrees. And okay. So I phoned the guy up. He said, "Right, potato, fantastic." So we're going to organise a factory, shipware industry in Hong Kong to cooperate with me to get it in production. And then, so that's going well. They were taking Germany. It was, we were selling around the world in the States in Australia, and <clears throat> next thing I hear is that Procter & Gamble were coming out with a low-cost, battery-operated, non-rechargeable toothbrush. I thought, well, that sounds like a good market, because there isn't any in the world <laughs> of quality, so I immediately started thinking. After about a week of going through every possible idea, concept of making one. A very original idea that I presented to Krups in Germany came back into my head and I thought, holy cow, this is it. <laughs> so I rushed out to my workshop the next morning, yep. made up a prototype, rough prototype to test it, it was brilliant. <laughs> so I immediately contacted my manufacturer, Chipware Industries, Explained everything to them, and they got all excited. <coughs> so I got some engineering drawings done, the pattern drawing, filed the pattern immediately. And worked together with Chipway Industries to get into production. Then I presented the site. Once I had something, then I decided to present it to Colgate. And so I spent about 10 days drafting a presentation letter yep. to Colgate. I got their address out from the Hong Kong office of Colgate, plus the person I sent it to. 
Um, so I'll send my uh, letter of explanation off. Three months later, no response. So I'll send a reminder by fax, fax, phone, fax number, direct telephone line numbers I have. So I'll send a reminder, fax, month later, no reply. So I thought, hell with this. So I picked up the phone and rang the guy. I said, I've been sending you letters about a new invention for electric, factory operated electric toothbrush. You haven't replied. He says, well, uh, to save time, can you refax it to me? And then call me back after five minutes later. <coughs> so I called him back. He says, you're speaking to the wrong person. You should be speaking to Nathan Vaisman. Mm -hmm. His direct fax number is this, and his direct telephone line is this. <laughs> so I sent, sent him the, the time of his fax, and after a while I phoned him. And he said, well, we have policies here. You have, we have to have non-confidential non disclosure agreements signed before we're willing to look at anything. Yeah. He said, I'll send you one. A couple of weeks later, this big thick envelope arrives with a Colgate's non confidential disclosure agreement. Non confidential. <laughs> so I immediately rushed to my attorneys in Hong Kong to get their opinion. I said, Well, you got your patents filed, you're, you're protected. This, this uh, agreement actually protects you yep. and them. It's no, no harm in signing it. So I signed it and couriered it back. Many months went by, nothing. No work. And there's World Dental Congress being conducted in Hong Kong that year. So I trot along to that. Especially if you go see the Colgate stand, I I might run into the Colgate guy <laughs> attending this Congress. Colgate had this enormous stand there, enormous, the biggest one in the whole Congress. Uh, <clears throat> I just walked, on the corner there was the reception, I just walked past there all the way through the, all, all through the stands, around, right around the back corner, there's, there was a counter with one guy behind it with a Colgate tag, his name on it. Very well dressed, and then the guy outside the counter in an extremely expensive suit, mm -hmm. cashmere suit with no identification. They were chatting, and so I walked over and excused myself for butting, butting into the conversation. But can you tell me that Tom Baseman attending the Congress? And I'm speaking to the guy with the Colgate tag, right? And the guy with no identification says, Why do you ask? He's back in New York office. So I explained to this guy all about my toothbrush and that I wasn't getting anywhere with my submissions to Colgo. And he said, I'm, going, I'm returning back to New York tomorrow. When I get back, I'll give Natan a call and tell him to chase along. He said, do you have a business card? So I'm pulling out a business card for exchange. Without my glasses, I couldn't read his card. Yeah, yeah. So we shook hands and parted. Then we go around to the canteen, mm -hmm. have a cup of coffee on with the glasses out with the car and that's the president. Then <laughs> 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 that, that's when everything started. <laughs> so that, then I had appointments in New York, samples. And got introduced to their R and D. It went on for a couple of years. It's, it's actually me that educated Colgate on pound toothbrushes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I developed a very close relationship with with the head of the R and D and another guy under him, and especially with Matan Bayesman, who was very close with the head of the R and D. An Indian, American Indian, East Indian, 
is also product selection, international product selection. And <coughs> in Volk and Marty. We all became quite close friends. So it's all very open communication. And, and the Indian guy was this, the pres vice president was slow making decisions. <laughs> so the Indian guy was telling me, well, what you've got to do, you've got to force them to make a decision. Start taking some territories away, because they're often a mold. Uh -huh. right. uh, <laughs> so I took away the European rights. And that set them up a bit. Then I took away the Australian and New Zealand rights. And appointed some being non-exclusive mining rights for Australia and New Zealand. And then I took away the Far East. Mm -hmm. Took away Africa. <laughs> they finished up with North and South America. Yep. By that time they decided that they might be losing out on something. <laughs> so in they, in they came. <clears throat> and, and, and when you say you took away their rights, that was basically you doing deals on a territory by territory basis. Yeah, non-exclusive. Yeah. So uh -huh. I can still have it open for Colgate to come in against it. Yeah. So then um, the first company to get going was Sunbeam in Australia. In an 18 month period of time, Sunbeam ordered 546,000. Just in Australia? Yeah. When they signed the agreement, they guarantee me 15,000 for the year. Okay. <laughs> By the time they placed the first order, it was 80,000. <laughs> then eventually Colgate went into Australia and sold them a million in one year. And Colgate went into the UK that became the number one retail product voted by the Retail Association. It's been the number one retail product for that particular year. But that was a hell of a success. That's what got me going into it. Well, that's how I got going into electric too. Too much space. Mm, that's, and uh, how long did that, that agreement Going for, and were you continually working with them on new products? And you know, I was feeding them a lot of information. And in that time, my key marketing guy resigned, so he's on business, so he's out. So I lost number one contact there. The Indian guy had a heart attack and died, so I lost him. The, uh, the vice president got changed. I lost him. So I lost all my key connections there. And this new upstart came into the R&D. A couple of R&D guys who I'm embarrassed, seriously embarrassed because I'm, I'm still channeling all these concepts and ideas for yeah. improvements and attachments and whatever. <laughs> And these guys in the R&D, they're coming up with nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so it reached the point where they got their nose so out of joint. And the policy in Colgate was any new submissions had to go to the R&D for appraisal and approval, recommendation, then go back up to the marketing and product selection. They just buried them. Mm -hmm. All my ideas stopped coming back. My last trip to New York was, I thought I'd be clever and sent my prototype, a very good prototype in advance so they could, R&D could look at it and study it. Mm -hmm. Ten days later I fly over for a meeting with the Vice President and everybody, and I lost my sample. I couldn't find it. So that I could demonstrate and explain all about it in the meeting. Uh -huh. this, this little guy, John Gatzmeyer, had lost it on purpose. This guy hated my guts because I embarrassed him so much. 
<laughs> yeah. So that was the end of my Colgate Association. And so what type of deal did you strike with them? Like what, what did they initially offer you and how did you go through that process? My deal was with the factory. They bought but a contract with Colgate, appointing them to market the product. Contract with the factory to manufacture my product for Colgate. And Colgate had a contract with the factory on their terms and conditions. My profit margin is in the factory price to Colgate. Doing, doing it that way relieved me of being an agent in between and being having liabilities. Yeah, yeah, that, that was uh, yeah, who has the liability for the uh, for the business. And then one, once a month, any shipments have been paid for, payment and cleared. Yeah, the fact we then pay it into my bank account in Singapore. Uh -huh. so that's what I was wanting to do. That this, same thing with CNI. That's why they're dealing directly with the factory on a toothbrush. And they're supposed to be paying me at the same time as they place the order. Yeah. With the factory. They have to at the same time transfer money into my bank account. So yeah. So the payments at the same time, the factory to me at the same time. Um, the, the initial order on the 30% or on the final order when they're ready to ship? The 30% profit, <coughs> that is, whenever they place the order or whatever, it says $2, my well, 30% has to be paid off at the same time as they pay the factory. Okay, when they pay the factory, when the factory is about to ship the product? If it sells C. Yeah. <coughs> With this factory, the deposit and balance by LC. Yep. Okay. <coughs> How do you choose a factory? How do you find the factories and do the deals with them? This particular factory, several of the staff are from the previous factory making my Colgate toothbrush, the original. And then this factory became a subcontractor making the Colgate toothbrushes. On the subcontractors for different production. If you have any product or uh, whatever it is, how do you go about choosing a factory? By word of mouth, hunting around. Before, when I was living in Hong Kong, I used to be all over the place, years to the ground, visiting factories. I used to be sussing them out all the time. Mm -hmm. What would you but look for? The last for? seven years, I've been. The last seven years I've been out of touch. So I have to just go by from my old connections. So what sort of things would you look for to know? Their method of production with their ISO 9000, 9001 or 2. Or if they're not, at least if they operate under those under that system, um, they have to have a very good quality in-house tool making workshop. How do you define that or how do you know what that is? By going and looking at it. Because if I went there and had a look, you I wouldn't you'd have be able to... fucking idea. So how do I have an idea? <laughs> how do I know? You'd have to go with somebody who can explain it to you. He went with James, James knows everything. Okay. So what, yeah, so go on with what you look for. Then the assembly, all the procedures, mm -hmm. plus they have to be financial. Because um, you would strike deals with them for the initial tooling, uh, the moulds. You'd share the, the costs and split the revenues with them. And the moulds. Well, this factory, I've done a deal on. Um, what was my deal? 
sometimes I do a deal they, they pay for all the tooling and amortise it over X number of sales. Sales, so, yeah, yeah. Other times it's share the cost 50-50. Or if I'm not comfortable with the factory, I want to own the tools so I can move them. Uh -huh, yeah. So I'll pay the whole lot. Payment for the tooling is normally like a, like a 30 or 40% deposit. So it's 40% deposit and 30% on first test shots of the models and then another 30 when the, everything's ready for production. And what uh, risk management quality control did you have in place? Well, I should do a lot of that myself. Yes. But the idea is to have the customer have their own QC. Oh, okay. So that eliminates your liability. Most of my most of my quality control is to make sure it's being manufactured properly. Yeah, according to your to meet my meet my standards. Yeah. To make sure they're not short short circuiting, changing the cheaper materials or whatever. Mm -hmm. So what would you mainly be doing day to day when you were having meetings and you were doing research? What would the main part of what you as an individual do? What would that be? So you mentioned the quality control. You work with the engineers from if your I went to the factory on a visit. I'd want to go and check the tools, make sure they're all in good condition, where they're working. What's been damaged? Have the tools been modified? It's quite often that tool makers make a mistake. They've cut steel out. Mm -hmm. They're not going to weld in, replace the steel, they're oh, welding yeah. it in. Ah. That shortens the life of the tool mm -hmm. enormously. Oh, okay. So it's, uh, you have to watch out for all these sort of things. And so typically, what does an actual tool cost? For the guitar, it's $12,000, uh, 14000 US dollars, so probably the first stop. Yeah. Which uh, seems a hell of a good price to me. Mm. And for the toothbrushes, is that around the similar price for a tool? Yeah. It's a toothbrush. I think it was. And, and you sometimes take the tool and try and do, negotiate better deals with other manufacturers? Like how much negotiation do you do with the factory? If, if the factory screws up, I just, just give them the notice that I'll we'll take the tools away. Okay. And just get the other factory, send the truck over and pick it up. Yep. So they get no chances if they stuff it up and you take it away immediately and they're aware of that. Yeah, they're aware of that. Yeah. You can't just go to the take away without telling anybody. Yeah. Yes, but just one chance, one strike and it's out. Yeah, you just explain to them that you're not not satisfied with their production, mm -hmm. the buildings, and you're going to take the tools away. And how did that impact if you were uh, splitting uh, revenue with them or the, the tooling costs initially if you've done a deal? So that's why it's important if you're doing a deal on sharing tooling costs, you've got to be sure the factory is going to be first and final right. factory. Yeah, that's what or, or having an option to buy the tool at a certain price if they open yeah. up. Yeah. Great. This is education, this is on YouTube for business school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, that's why we're recording it. <laughs> Hi, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Lauren will play this in a school in, when she's teaching her kids at uni as well. Yeah, so you say hi to my students. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so that's the Colgate story. So any other stories that you want to share with us? My, my greatest personal achievement of satisfaction of having made something, mm -hmm. designed something, was didn't make a hell of a lot of money out of it, but <laughs> an enormous amount of satisfaction <laughs> was the hot air hot air and brush with an adjustable brush. You know these hot air curler brushes? Yeah. You have uh, normally you have different sized brushes that click in. Yeah, different sized curls. I designed one where you just turn the knob on the end. The brush got large or small. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I had two models, one knob on the end, the other one was the knob at the front of the handle. It was fantastic. It was, it was incredible. <laughs> incredible development. It's all of the cams. It was just cams going this way, that way, that way. Mm -hmm. and, and who took on that particular product? In Australia, the lady Remington was marketing it. Everybody in the world was marketing it. Except Phillips. I don't think Phillips were marketing it. And what gave you the inspiration for that idea and that product? Uh, I was just thinking about hair care products and the problems. And when you have something with lots of attachments, people lose the attachments. It's a man of having lots of attachments. So I thought, thought I'd design the hot airbrush with there's no attachments. None of all these different barrel sizes to put on. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> It was quite amazing.